Hello and welcome to Baiju's Exam Prep IAS. A very very warm good morning to everyone. I hope all of you are doing good. I welcome you all to today's session of the Hindu newspaper analysis, where we will be decoding the day's important news, both from the prelims and the mains examination point of view. These are the topics that we have taken up for today's discussion. From the mains examination point of view, we have about three articles. First article is about the challenges that the nation around the world are facing right now. including the wars including threat of civil disorder then there are threats about climate change and the rising role of the ai then we'll be discussing the second article where the author is writing about whether there is a need to revamp the supreme court of india most importantly the author right now in this article is pointing out towards a need to have a specific constitution bench of the supreme court which is permanent and allowing the rest of the supreme court to handle other kind of cases which mostly come in the form of the appeal the third article is about dollarization now why exactly is this in the news recently argentina had its elections and they have chosen a very interesting president a president who is an economist who is a tv personality who has very very radical views interestingly one of the promises that he made during his election campaigning was that if he becomes a president of argentina he will disregard the currency of argentina and he will make the us dollar as the official currency of argentina argentina is a country that is undergoing a lot of economic troubles so we'll be discussing can this dollarization help a country come out of its economic troubles then from the prelims exam point of view the first article is on the fiber optic cables how do they work their origin story how are they important right now in the world of technology next there is an article on rat hole mining from the front page of the hindu newspaper we still see ongoing efforts on the side of the government agencies to bring out the 41 trapped workers now the government agencies have taken the help of some rat hole miners that will start manual digging from today onwards we'll be discussing what that is actually Then there's an ILO report that has come out, which talks about the fact that countries around the world need to protect their workers more. And in the end, the 2023 Booker Prize Award was given to Ireland's author Paul Lynch. We'll be discussing what the Booker Prize is. So let's begin with the first article. Now the first article is a, let's say, a generic article, not based on one single issue. now this is something that you will notice in newspapers such as the hindu or even the indian express on the days when they don't have a specific big story when they don't really have an article that is specifically suited for that day what they do is they ask their authors to write generic articles which they could publish at any point of time this is one of those articles it could be have been published one week back or even one week later but it would not have made a difference anyway what this article is all about It's written by Mr. M. K. Narayanan, a very famous author. He keeps on writing in the Hindu newspaper. He is a former national security adviser. He says that the world right now is facing multiple challenges. We are living in challenging times, and the nations around the world have to come together in order to resolve all these disputes. Otherwise, if that does not happen, we are looking at a bleak future. So he points out towards certain challenges. It's not a complete list. There's obviously a lot of other things that you can add to this list as well. Let's see what are the challenges that he talks about. The first challenge he says that the nation around the world are facing is multipolar disorder. He says that around the world there is still violence widespread in many parts of the world. Terrorism has still not died. we see terror related activities around the world in various forms you just know and recognize these terror groups by different names depending on where you live in india you might be more familiar with lakshar taiba if you are living in the us you are be more familiar with al qaeda if you are living in africa you are be more familiar with the group called the boko haram but at the end of the day there are a lot of these terror groups that exist and their power is still not going down we saw the october 7 attacks conducted by hamas on israel it also indicated that with the rising use of technology these terror groups still have enough technology and finances in their hands to have a big impact on even the most powerful nation in the world this is what we saw in case of israel as well israel which is regarded around the world as one of the most technologically sound countries their border that they had built to segregate gaza strip with israel 
they had spent billions of dollar on that border saying that it is the world's best technology and all that was brought down by the hamas terrorists then we see violence in other forms as well look at the ukraine russia war it has gone on for over one and a half years now sometimes in the news you would see that russia has an upper hand in the other times you would see that ukraine has an upper hand with the help of the western nations but still the war does not have any end in sight look at what's happening in israel yes there is a cease fire in operation right now between israel and palestine but that cease fire will not be indefinite and we most probably will again go back to the same period that means that all these agreements signed in the middle east be it the abraham accord be it the other deals that have been mediated by china by us all of them right now are hanging in the balance and no one knows the future to it so first he says the first big problem there is no sight of peace in the world the world is undergoing multiple issues there have been multiple forms of violence around the world second big problem he talks about the indo pacific region now indo pacific region is specifically extremely important for india india plays a big role in this region as you would have noticed in the past few years big countries around the world the countries that are not even from this region have been taking a very keen interest in this region us japan australia along with india have formed the cord a lot of european countries have their naval presence in indo pacific france canada all of these have been speaking about the indo pacific why first it is considered as the biggest trading hub the economic hub of the world because some of the most population wise big countries are in this region india china etc then you also have this area where you see a lot of trade between big countries so if for example let's say china over here let's say if they have to sell something to west asia this middle east all of that goes through indo pacific similarly if china has to import oil and gas from west asian countries all of that will go through this area then we have australia as well becoming an economic power with every single passing year we have countries such as japan all these are primary players in indo pacific the problem for all these countries is called as china the expansionist policies of china in this region specifically have made a lot of countries uncomfortable including india as well countries believe that china is trying to acquire influence in as many of these island countries in pacific as possible there are a lot of these small island pacific countries that are getting help from china in the form of infrastructure money in the form of any other help that china can give china realizes that these small nations in pacific don't require a lot of money and china can just give that money in the name of infrastructure and bring them to their side china's expansion policy in the south china sea also where they have a dispute with, with countries such as philippines vietnam etc all that has made many countries uncomfortable now the difference between what is happening between europe what is happening between ukraine and russia and in indo pacific is between ukraine and russia ukraine has a direct support of nato it is because of nato and the help of us specifically that ukraine has been able to sustain for such a long time but the author says in indo pacific they don't have any such group there are informal groupings occur squad but they are not specifically military groupings so if push comes to the shove and if there is a situation of a direct conflict with china it remains to be seen whether china faces any big group or there are just individual countries who are unwilling to fight a war with china third problem <laughs> it's a very pessimistic article i must tell you no solutions only problems so third big problem that the author is pointing towards the role of technology now emerging technologies around the world present their own challenges the buzzword around the world is artificial intelligence now while artificial intelligence might have its own pros it has been able to change our lives for the better in many cases but it has a lot of dangers attached to it you all would know the famous case of deep fakes now a lot of celebrity videos are now put online where the celebrities are shown but these are all false videos even the prime minister made a statement against this we are living in an extremely extremely sensitive time just imagine 
if a politician or a famous leader who has following in millions and millions, there's a deep fake video of that politician, if it is circulated online, where he is instigating someone to commit a crime. Imagine how tough that situation would be to control. Add to that the issue of hacking, add to that the fact that hackers are continuously getting their hands on topmost technology, that also creates a challenge. So the author says, basically it's a very bad time to live. Problem in Indo-Pacific, violence everywhere, technology getting out of hand. So what can we do about it? Author has not told this. Let me tell you what has the government done in India and in other parts. So let's see what India and other countries are doing specifically in the field of global AI. That is how to restrict and regulate the use of artificial intelligence. If you see online, you will see a lot of different business leaders have spoken up for the need to regulate AI. Elon Musk is at the top of that list. However, the companies that are working in the field of AI, they don't seem to be open to this idea to regulate this. For them, they continuously support the idea that no AI is for the benefit of the humankind. Nations around the world are now bringing in more regulation like India. Niti Aayog issued some guiding documents on AI issues. That document was called National Strategy for AI and Responsible AI for All Report. In UK, the government has outlined an approach for regulators of how to regulate AI. There was a white paper published by the government outlining five principles the companies should follow. Now, these are some of the things which are important for your exam. Because in the exam, if you get a question on AI, the need for regulation, how can you regulate some suggestions, you can give certain suggestions such as this. That we can also ask the regulators to follow these five principles as UK has done, safety, security and robustness, transparency and explainability, fairness, accountability and governance, contestability and redress. What has the US done? US has released a blueprint for AI Bill of Rights. So they are trying to get a proper law in place for AI to regulate, to understand what the, what the companies can do and what the companies cannot do who are working in the field of AI. Then we have China in 2022, that is last year, China brought out the world's first nationally binding regulation on the use of AI, on how AI can be used and how AI cannot be used. Now, despite all these regulations in place, the one thing that everyone agrees to is that AI is here to stay. You do not see any country banning AI for that matter. You do not see any country restricting people from the use of AI. It's all about how can you regulate it. In terms of AI also, as the years pass by, the technology will become better and better and better. For example, it started with something called reactive AI, where machine learning operations just try to make the machines react to certain situations, then have a limited memory where they can handle some complex classification task. This is the current state of AI, where most of the world is, where you have smart cars like Tesla is making driverless cars, etc. Then theory of mind will be the next stage. It will be a stage where the machines will be able to understand human motives and human reasoning. Right now, the machines only understand the human actions and not human motives, why a human would be doing a thing like that. And the end goal would be human level intelligence or something that can bypass human's intelligence as well. This will be the eventual goal and this is where most of the fear is that what if machines become smarter than human beings? What if machines start to harm the human beings? Then who will put up these machines? That is where the challenge basically lies. Let's come out of that pessimistic article to the second one. The second article that we have here is written about the Supreme Court of India. The author here is making a point that the Supreme Court of India was set up mainly for specific purposes of interpretation of the constitution and looking into important legal matters. But what has happened is over the years, the Supreme Court has been burdened so much with cases which should not have come to Supreme Court because of it, the Supreme Court now does not have enough time for important cases. For example, it might surprise you, but do you know in Supreme Court, you even have cases of landlords versus tenants 
where landlord does not or where the landlord wants a tenant to vacate and the tenant does not want to vacate the house even those kind of cases there are even instances of traffic chalan cases coming to supreme court in certain instances this is why the supreme court is so burdened with all these cases that they don't have enough time specifically to hear important constitutional matters which require the interpretation of the constitution and this becomes a challenge as you know the supreme court has the constitution bench constitution bench means a bench of five judges or more this is a bench that is formed to hear constitutional matters where interpretation of the constitution is required usually what happens most of the cases when they come to supreme court usually they are heard by a division bench what's a division bench division bench means two judges please understand no case in the supreme court can be heard by one single judge it happens at the high court level till the high court level in the supreme court no case is heard by one single judge so the least number of judges that can hear your case are two judges so usual cases small little case are heard by two judges it's called a division bench now what happens in this division bench if in case both the judges give the same verdict then obviously the case is decided but if the verdict is divided one judge says yes one judge says no then the case goes to a larger bench then it comes to or there is another concept of full bench full bench means three judges after that it comes or the magnitude goes to constitution benches which are five judges it can be 7 9 11 as well how many judges would there be in a specific bench to hear a specific matter it is decided by the chief justice of india the chief justice of india is what we call the master of the roster master of the roster means he decides the scheduling he decides the hearing pattern he decides which judge will hear what case which judge or which case requires how many judges all of that is decided by the supreme court chief justice now the constitution bench that we are talking about here has the important job of interpreting the constitution and hearing matters which require constitutional interpretation now this is where it gets interesting the supreme court uh, the author says that this was the most important job of the supreme court but they don't have enough time that is why right now they have 79813 pending cases in the supreme court which has 34 judges right now <coughs> now what is the suggestion here what can we do the suggestion is first to have separate constitution bench means to have a group of judges let's say 5 7 judges or 11 judges whatever who will only and only work as a constitution bench so that every single time there is a case that comes up which requires interpretation of the constitution it is given on priority to that bench specifically because right now what happens these constitutional interpretation cases also get jumbled up with the other cases and they are not heard on a priority matter and this is a suggestion that is not new it has been given by multiple other commissions in the past march 1984 law commission of india proposed that supreme court should be split into two divisions one constitutional division to only hear constitutional interpretation matters and second one called the legal division same recommendation was repeated with the 11th law commission as well they also said the same thing but it has not been implemented now over here let me tell you one more aspect of the supreme court which many people don't listen to or many people just ignore a few years back and even today an idea was floated of the national court of appeals now understand this a few years back we had the chief justice of india chief justice t s thakur chief justice t s thakur while he was retiring he made a speech and he gave a lot of important data one of the most important things that he talked about in his speech was if you look at how many cases come to supreme court from which state from which state are the cases filed in the supreme court you will see very interestingly that most of the cases filed in the supreme court are from the states which are nearby delhi delhi itself uttar pradesh punjab haryana rajasthan 
these are the places from where most of the cases in Supreme Court will come. For example, about 10-12% of cases in the Supreme Court are from UP, 8-10% to are from Delhi. This is a usual number. On the other hand, if you compare the cases that come to Supreme Court from states far off, like Kerala, Tamil Nadu, Karnataka, Andhra Pradesh, Telangana, all of these combined do not even make up 10% of the cases that come to Supreme Court. At the time that he made the speech, he said about 1% of our cases in the Supreme Court come from Kerala. Less than 2% come from Tamil Nadu. If you combine all these five states and include Puducherry as well as the sixth one, you would see not even 10% of the Supreme Court cases are filed from these states. Now, why is that a case? The usual reason for that is, why would someone come so far off to Delhi if they don't have the means? Because see, these cases are not just decided on one single day. You have to come regularly, continuously, there's a lot of expense that is involved. So many people don't just want to go to Supreme Court, they will go to High Court if the matter is decided against them, they just leave it be. So the idea was, let us set up something called National Court of Appeal. So basically after High Court, if you have to appeal, rather than going to Supreme Court, you will go to National Court of Appeal. Leave the Supreme Court only for constitutional matters. Other cases that are coming from the High Court as a way of appeal should go to National Court of Appeal and it should have different branches. Let's say one in Mumbai, one in Chennai, one in Kolkata, so on and so forth. One may be towards the northeast part of the country. Something like this is an idea that has been floated, but again, it has not been accepted. In fact, this idea of National Court of Appeal has found some support in Supreme Court as well back in 1980s. But with the Supreme Court also, you have to understand, when we say that Supreme Court supported an idea, that means the current judge of the Supreme Court supported this idea. So tomorrow, if the judge retires, new judge comes in, he or she might have a different point of view. So in 1980s, the Supreme Court did support the idea. But after that, whoever has become the Chief Justice has not supported the idea. Because their argument is, we don't have enough judges. To set up these four or five branches and then have a Supreme Court as a Constitution Court separately, you require a lot more judges. And... All together in the Supreme Court, we still have only 34 judges. We don't have enough quality to increase the number of judges significantly in the Supreme Court. And that is why this idea has still not found the light. As you can see, the idea was supported by Law Commission as well to set up four regional benches, something like the National Court of Appeal as well. But it has not been done so far. Now, many people also blame the Parliament for not increasing the number of judges. It's partially true. The parliament has not done a very, I would say, quick job in increasing the number of judges. We have 34 judges. The number got increased in 2019. And the most interesting part is in 2019, when the judges were increased from 31 to 34, just one year back in 2018, the government's own economic survey came out. And in the economic survey of the government of India of 2018, the survey said, if... The Supreme Court spending cases have to be resolved in the next eight years. Understand, if the Supreme Court spending cases have to be resolved in the next eight years, we need at least 50 judges in the Supreme Court, 5-0. This is what the government's own economic survey had said. But even after that, the number of judges were increased only by three. Now, you might have your own reasons behind it. The government says that we can't compromise on the quality of the judges just to increase the number. But yes... By any stretch of imagination, by any parameter, you see, we do not have enough judges. Today, the Supreme Court usually has given, usually gives 8 to 10 decisions through the constitution benches. Just 8 to 10. So, a lot of constitutional matters get diverted. They are just postponed time and time again. In fact, in 2022... Out of the 1,263 decisions that the Supreme Court gave, only four of them were given by a constitutional bench. And thus, there is a very strong case of setting up specific constitutional bench for the Supreme Court or giving them just the work of hearing such cases and no other case. Now, if you look at how many cases do we have in the Supreme Court, you can get real-time data as I've done here for you. 
all that you have to do is go on Google and search for National Judicial Data Grid. I'll just write it here. I've told this earlier as well. You just have to go to National Judicial Data Grid. When the website opens up on the left top corner, you will have an option to go to Supreme Court's portal. So when you click on Supreme Court's portal, specifically, this is the data that you will get. It gets updated real time about the number of cases that are pending, how many criminal cases, how many civil cases are pending, so on and so forth. Now, over here, I'll show you one more very interesting data, something that many people misunderstand. Many people think that uh, most of the cases in the Supreme Court take many, many years to be disposed. But look at this interesting data. 76% cases in the Supreme Court were disposed in one year, within one year. So it's not a norm that every case in the Supreme Court will take five years or 10 years, etc. Yes, a lot of these cases do take a long time, but 76% cases, more than that, have been resolved within just one year. So when if you're quoting these kind of things in the answer, that most of the cases in Supreme Court take a long time, you should know this data. This is all from the Supreme Court's own data, uh, data grid. So it's not a data that the government or that anyone can tamper with. It's a data that the Supreme Court itself has produced. Let's move on to the third article now. The third article is from economics. As I said in the beginning, in the introduction part, it's about dollarization, specifically regarding what's happening in Argentina. So Argentina just had its presidential election and they have elected Javier Milei as the new president. Now he's a famous TV personality, uh, has very radical views. If you watch global news, you will see he made it a point to criticize the government on everything. So basically he said, I'll cut down on the government spending. He famously during his election campaign was seen with a chainsaw. I don't know if you know the chainsaw. So chainsaw basically is a machine that is used to cut down the trees. So he used to be photographed with a chainsaw and he used to see, say, I will cut down the government. I'll cut down the government. So basically what he says is, we don't need so many ministries. What is the use of environment ministry? I will not have it. What is the use of women and child welfare ministry? I will not have it. What is the use of youth ministry, sports ministry? All of this is nonsense. I'll remove all of that. So he had very drastic views very, very uh, views which are not usually seen in most of the politicians. Despite that, he won the election. One of his other interesting views was, he said that Argentina is going through such a tough time inflation wise. The country has seen over 100% inflation means the price of the things getting doubled. He said that as per him, the one way to come out of this economic turmoil is to adopt dollar and get rid of Argentina's own currency. This is the theme of this article. That is it a good step for any country to ditch their own currency that they control, that they can print and move to a global currency like dollar. This is called dollarization. Can you imagine India saying that we would not follow our own Indian rupee now and we would rather follow the dollar. What will be the implications of this? Have other countries done this or not? This is what this article is about. So right now, Argentina's currency is peso. They want to slash this or the new president wants to remove this. Why? Because he thinks that their own central bank controls this currency and he does not want the central bank to have any control. He wants that we should rather have an international currency so that our central bank cannot control it. Now, it's very odd. In India, for example, we want the RBI to control inflation. We want the RBI to ensure market stability. For that, they can only do that if we have our own currency. If you don't have your own currency, if you are just relying on dollar or euro or pound, then your central bank will not be able to make any major changes in how inflation works. But in Argentina, they are saying, or the president is saying that we do not want interference of the World Bank. We would rather go adopt dollar. Why? Because they say that the inflation is over 100%. Now, what he is suggesting or the reason why he is saying that we will make those changes is he says that the last government has just printed unlimited supply of currency. Why? 
the last government whenever the government thought that the price of commodity is increasing that is inflation the government wanted to keep the people happy so they kept on printing their own currency distributing it free to the people and that has created all this mess so he says that if we ditch our currency we will not have our currency so the government itself will not be able to print that so it will automatically cut down the sub the demand of goods and inflation will control automatically so this is what his argument is it's a drastic measure but he wants to control inflation not by increasing supply but he wants to control inflation by decreasing the demand by cutting down the money supply in from the hands of the people not giving any money to the people and automatically you will see that the prices will be under control that's his argument now the interesting part is he said all these things in the election campaigning he said that as soon as i come to power we will remove our currency adopt the dollar however now that he has come to power he is saying okay we will think about it just like most politicians do they are different while they are in the opposition and they are very different when they come to power this has happened with him as well he has thinking that i he is saying that i'm thinking about this topic in detail taking advice from the other economists as well now dollarization can have a positive impact on growth on paper as i said if you have a country where there is a very high inflation and the previous governments have printed a lot of money it's a good way to remove that money from the market and bring in a currency that is much much more stable also since it's a small economy you can only access dollar through foreign trade how can argentina get enough dollars to run their economy they don't print the dollar they can't ask the us to give them dollar for free so what can they do if they have to earn the dollar they will have to export a lot of stuff only then they will be able to earn dollar so that would encourage the exporters that would also ease conditions for foreign capital they would have to get their money they would have to get their economy more lucrative they have to make their economy more attractive for others to come and invest their dollars this is the idea would it happen would it not happen remains to be seen but that is what on paper the idea is now it has obviously some complications involved in it first big complication every country every central bank would want to have a control over their own currency to give away the control of the currency to not be able to control the money supply can have a lot of impact for example after the covid-19 crisis when americans got free money from their government we saw inflation all around the world why because america decided to print dollar they can do that it's their currency they have not forced anyone to keep dollar as their currency americans printed much more dollar they distributed freely to their people which led to more money in the hands of americans leading to inflation worldwide if such a situation arises again and a country does not control the supply of dollar it becomes problematic for them when you don't control your own money supply you will no longer be able to take the resources you will not be able to play with your currency like what china does for example a part of the reason why china has been able to build its export why countries around the world want to import from china is that chinese goods appear to be cheaper how because china has depreciated its currency china has made sure that the value of the currency is low so that you can buy much more chinese stuff for lesser money this is not something that you can do if you don't have control over your currency so it becomes very difficult for you to have a monetary policy in your favor now while there are many people who are criticizing argentina's policy there is a very interesting case of a country that has done this in the past ecuador now ecuador a country in south america which has a lot of chinese investment but that's a different topic altogether Ecuador did the same a few years back when they saw that their currency was declining heavily and they had very very high inflation so what happened in late 1990s their economy was going down it was contracting inflation was 67% their currency that is sucker it was depreciating by almost 200% in 2099 and amidst all of that in the year 2000 it was announced that they are adopting dollar since then what has happened since then the economy has stabilized considerably 
their GDP has grown not at a very fast pace, but it has grown in a very stable manner. There has been a GDP growth of 4.5% between 2001 and 2014. Their poverty has also reduced, their inequality has also reduced in the country. So almost all the parameters by which you would judge a country's economy have shown good improvement in case of Ecuador. But did Ecuador economy improve only because it switched to dollar? No, not really. Just because you switch to dollar does not mean that automatically your country or your economy will bloom. There are policy reasons for that as well. One big thing that many of us ignored was that Ecuador also has a lot of oil and gas reserves. 2000s, the era when it adopted dollar was also a time when the oil and gas prices boomed automat all of a sudden. And when the oil and gas prices boomed, they obviously had much more inflow of the dollars, which is why they were able to adopt dollar. In case of Argentina, that might not be true. You can have a lot of inflow of dollar if you sell something that the entire world requires. With Argentina, that is not the case. If you could export a lot, you would have a lot more dollars. You can have dollars, your currency. That is what worked with Ecuador. But with Argentina, that might not work in that manner. Another example, contrary to Ecuador, a country which did not have success in this policy was Greece. Now, what did Greece do? So Greece adopted Euro. They adopted the currency of the Eurozone, that is Euro. They thought that they would be able to attract a lot more people because it's a tourist-based economy, a lot of tourists come in. They thought that they'll have a lot of investment, tourism, and they will have a lot more Euro coming in. But the Eurozone crisis hit them very, very hard. And Greece became susceptible to this currency, which was not in their hands. They could not print it all of a sudden. They were dependent on other Eurozone countries. They had to convince the European Union to give them loan time and time again. They could not control their own monetary policy. They had to go to the IMF time and time again. IMF put very heavy restrictions on them. All of that culminated into Greece sliding into an economic downfall. So there are examples on both the sides on whether you want your currency to be in your hand, you would not want that in your hand. Now, the interesting part is, if you forget this article for a moment, around the world, if you see, most of the countries are not going towards the dollar, rather they are moving away from the dollar. You have read a lot of articles about de-dollarization, especially ever since the COVID-19 crisis, America printing a lot more dollar, then Ukraine, Russia war, where Americans imposed a lot of sanctions on Russia, which feared many countries, thinking that their dollar would be worthless if America put sanctions on them. That is why many countries have been trying to ditch the dollar. China has been doing this for a long time now. Brazil also is expanding bilateral currency trade with many countries such as China, Japan. Indonesia has also been doing that. And India also is one of those countries that is trying to have de-dollarization as a topmost priority. We are trying to get into as many agreements as possible with other countries to deal in INR, that is our currency or their currency, rather than dealing in dollars. The BRICS countries are also discussing for some summits now the idea of ditching dollar and maybe opting a BRICS currency itself. In Africa as well, the, current, the nations in Africa are trying to go away from dollar. So what Argentina is doing is going against what most of the countries are doing right now. It is ditching the dollar. They are rather moving towards the dollar. Now, what is India doing specifically to ditch the dollar? We have been signing multiple bilateral currency agreements, as I said, with countries with which we have high trade, such as the UAE. We have been opening special rupee Vosto accounts in different countries, such as UK, Russia, you would have heard about Vostro. I would, if you have not, I'll give you this homework. Please read about Vostro. Tell me in the comment section the difference between Vostro and Nostro account. Not that difficult to understand. Read about these. Tell me in the comment section how are these two different? The Vostro account and the Nostro account. Also, 
India has been trying to internationalize our currency, get as many countries to adopt INR as possible so that we reduce our dependency on dollar. For India, it's a long way to go. But what Argentina is doing is much more radical, much, much more drastic as compared to the other nations. These were the articles from the mains exam point of view. Now, from the prelims exam point of view, the first article is from Science. There's an article written about fiber optic cables. How do they work? Their science, origin story, etc. Now, again, this is not something that is in the news. But again, as I said, as a newspaper, you have to publish every single day. Even when there is no big news happening right now, you have to fill up pages. So you take up some topics that are not in the news, but some very generic topics, which are just about technology. This is what the Hindu newspaper also does. So there's an article about the fiber optic cables. Now, those who know it or are from engineering background or not even from engineering background, if you remember class 9th, 10th science, in 9th and 10th science, we read about the idea of optical fiber cable. So basically, in simple terms, the wire that you use in your house made up of copper usually to carry current. The problem with those wires is when you use those wires, it has a lot of loss. So he generates heat, the amount of current that you are trying to transfer, a lot of it will be lost in the middle. So now there is an alternate to it. These are called fiber optic cable. These are again cables made up of glass very, very thin. They have a diameter of about a human hair. They can carry extreme amounts of information, such as text, images, voice, video calls, etc. The, the internet that you use, the broadband that you use, all of that is because of the fiber optic cable. Now, the idea with fiber optic cable is that the loss or attenuation, as you call it, is almost negligible. In fact, the person behind the discovery of fiber optic communication, Dr. Charles Cow, has even received the Nobel Prize in Physics in 2009. Fiber optic cable, in fact, is the reason why the entire world is connected. How is it possible that on your laptop you type facebook.com and you see a photo or your video in front of you? Where is that photo or video stored? Whatever photo, video, text that you upload on these websites gets stored on their servers. Consider them as huge storage spaces. Let's say Facebook has a server in America. So whatever photo, video you updated on Facebook, your account, it all gets stored in the Facebook server in America. When you open facebook.com, that server will load that photo or video in front of you. You'll be able to see that. How does that communication happen? This is where the role of fiber optic cables comes in. So basically, underneath the oceans around the world, the countries are connected with these very, very thick cables. These are the fiber optic cables. So the entire world right now owes a lot to the fiber optic cable. Now, how do these work? If I have to explain this to you in very simple term, there is an idea called total internal reflection. Total internal reflection or TIR as you call it is a phenomena behind the use of fiber optic cable. So basically it is a form of light that passes through these cable. Light as you know is an electromagnetic wave. It has spectrum of different frequencies. Now the idea is that when you are transmitting light signals inside the cable, you have to make sure that they are traveling at such an angle that they are completely reflected inside rather than being reflected outside or rather than going outside the glass. This is where the technique of total internal reflection comes. And let me show you with the help of a photo. I'll just come back to it. Look at this. So basically, if this is the incident ray, that is, this is the original signal, when it when there's a change of surface, let's say there's optical fiber cable, this is fiber, and then outside of that there will be air. So when you have this incident ray, how do you make sure that this is not going out and it is internally reflected inside? This is based on the angle at which you are actually focusing these signals. This angle has to be more than the critical angle. So critical angle basically is an angle where if you put this incident ray, it will go along with the surface. It will have a 90 degree angle with the normal. 
if you need total internal reflection, if you want the light to be reflected internally without any signal going outside the source, this is where total internal reflection comes into the picture. It all depends on finding out what will be the critical angle and you have to make sure that the angle at which you are putting your foc you are putting your signal has to be more than the critical angle of that surface. Now in India, there is a very big fiber optics lab at the Center Glass and Ceramic Research Institute in Kolkata. It has been able to develop very, very high quality fiber optic cable. Today's fiber optic cable have a loss very, very low, less than 0.2 decibel per kilometer. So again, it is something that is connecting the entire world together. The government of India has realized the importance of this and the government has already announced National Mission on Quantum Technology and Application. It's a mission that will be achieved over five years with the spend of 8,000 crore rupees. It's mostly about expanding the scope of fiber optic cable and other forms of technology to give better communication experience. In 2020, as you know, the government of India launched submarine optical fiber cable to Andaman Nicobar Islands, again to build much better broadband connectivity to these islands. This is what total internal reflection is. It's something that we have all read in science, 9th, 10th, even before that in some cases. It is a phenomena which occurs when you, when the propagating wave strikes at the boundary, at the angle which is higher than the critical angle. Thus remember that if the angle of incidence is greater than the critical angle, we cannot pass through and it is entirely reflected within the medium. This is called total internal reflection. This is a very, very basic science, something that can be asked in the prelims examination. About the national quantum mission that the government of India had launched for a five year period, it will be implemented by Department of Science and Technology. The mission has been planned for 2023 to 2031. India has become the seventh country only to have a dedicated quantum mission. There are some other countries that have also done the same. The idea is to focus on quantum computing, to build many more quantum computers in India with very high capacity, to develop magnetometers with high sensitivity using atomic clocks, which will be helpful in navigation, making sure that our navigation systems become world class. The mission will also focus on developing satellites, which will ensure quantum communication between ground stations and the range of 2000 kilometers within the country. All these are important aspects of national quantum mission that the government of India has already launched. Next is a front page news about the ongoing rescue mission in the Silkyara tunnel. Now mining workers will start or have already started manual digging. They will now dig by hand because the big machine, as you know, has been stuck now in the girder. So basically when you are digging in the tunnel, obviously the tunnel is standing because there is a lot of beams and a lot of materials that are going through the tunnel right now to build a structure of it. So when you are using a machine, let's say if this is a tunnel and you're using the machine to dig this tunnel, there are a lot of pipes here, there are a lot of beams, girders, all of that is built with very heavy metal. So the machine has gotten stuck in all of this and it is not working. So the remaining part of the digging will has to be done, will have to be done by hands. This is where rat hole miners have come into the picture. Now it's very interesting. What is rat hole mining and why is it interesting? So rat hole mining is something that we usually see in a state of Meghale. So Meghale has some coal mines very small coal mines. Um, they are not as large as to be used in a commercial manner. So companies don't come and explore those minerals. But the local population, basically by hands, they just try to dig the land and they try to get out as much coal as possible. It's extremely dangerous. It does not use a lot of machine. It does not have any safety equipment. So the government of India, Supreme Court, they have already banned rat hole mining. It's banned in India, in Meghalaya specifically, although there are new stories that it does happen. But now what the government has done, government has called those rat hole miners because 
it may be banned but the government knows that they are the experts in doing all of this in doing mining in very very small places so although this practice has been banned in 2014 these land owned rat hole miners have been called in to help and they have now started digging in 2014 this practice was banned by supreme courts meghalaya government challenged it saying that our local population needs sustenance and they are dependent on this for their occupation, but it has not been released. The ban still exists. Remember, now this is again an unscientific method where individuals and communities try to take out coal. In Meghalaya, the coal reserve is about 640 million tons, but the commercial mining usually does not take place in Meghalaya in large numbers because the coal seam is extremely thin. Usually you don't have big machines or big companies coming in to remove this. The government does not have a policy in place to regulate this mining. But again, this has been banned by the Supreme Court. But as you can see here, an article of just about a week ago from the Hindu newspaper, which says illegal coal mining activity, that is rat hole mining, is still very much prevalent in the state of Meghalaya. Now, interestingly, the same miners have been called to help in this ongoing operation. Next is a news report based on the ILO report that has just come out. ILO, that is the International Labour Organization, has released a report where they have given some very, very, very eye-opening numbers about the death of the workers. In this report, they are talking about why the workers lose their life in the working environment, what are the reasons behind it, and what are the areas in the world where the governments have been negligible. This report of the ILO is titled A Call for Safer and Healthier Working Environment. As per the ILO, 30 lakh workers die every year around the world. 30 lakh, that is 3 million, due to accidents and diseases. Over 63% of these deaths are in just the Asia-Pacific region. The reason for that, single biggest reason, was the long working hours, the stress due to that. About 55 hours or more per week. Still less than 70 hours suggested by our corporate leader. But 55 hours or more, that has been the biggest killer. With 7.5 lakh people dying of it in 2016 itself. Then other reasons include people getting exposed to harmful gases, matter, fumes, etc. Because they are working in such occupation and such bad conditions. This is what this report tells. Injuries come at the third place, then asbestos, silica, all these are reasons because of it the workers have lost their life. But again, most interestingly, long working hours remains a topmost cause of the death of the workers. Now, apart from this, the ILO report also says that one of the ILO conventions, that is Occupational Safety and Health Convention, has not been ratified by a lot of countries. A lot of countries have not taken the steps required to ensure proper health standards for the workers. Many nations have not even ratified Occupational Safety and Health Convention 2006. That was a later form. There were some changes in this convention that has not been signed. Even India has not ratified these conventions. Please understand, there is a difference between signing and ratifying. The difference is, for example, if an Indian representative goes to the ILO, signs on that treaty, that means we have signed the treaty. But that does not mean it will be implemented. After that, the next step will be the treaty will be passed in our parliament. That is called ratification. Only then it will be implemented. So ratification is the next step. It is done by the parliament of the country. Only when the parliament ratifies it or passes it, then it will be implemented in the country. Now, if you look at the ILO convention, the report also recommended five categories of fundamental principles and rights at work that the countries must adopt. For example, right to collective bargaining, right to eliminate all the forced compulsory labor, abolition of child labor, discrimination in employment should also be abolished. All these are ILO suggestions that the nations around the world should accept especially in the Asia-Pacific region where most of the deaths have been seen. Now, we have discussed this earlier, but just reminding you, remember there are a total of eight core conventions of the ILO amongst all of them. There are hundreds of total conventions. Eight of them are considered as core. 
Out of these eight, six have been ratified by India. Two have not been ratified by India. Which have not been ratified first, the freedom of association, protection of the right to organize convention. Because we think then there would be strikes and etc. in India. Second, the right to organize collective bargaining that has also not been ratified by India. But from these two, the other six core conventions have been ratified by the government of India. The last article that we have here is about the Booker Prize that has been given to an author from Ireland that is Paul Lynch for his novel called The Prophet Song. So this prize is given to fictional stories, fictional uh, stories and novels that are written. Fictional means again which is not true, it's a story that has been made. The novel that has gone got the prize this year is called The Prophet Song. The winner of this prize gets £50,000, that is $63,000. This is an award that was started in 1969. It is given to English language novels. Those novels that can be written anywhere, but they were published in UK and Ireland. It has been given to authors around the world. There is no bar on which country the author has to be from. For example, last year, just last year, the author that won the prize was from Sri Lanka. She had written an article. She had written a very, very interesting story about a lady whose husband passes away. Then she's into depression. Then she goes back to Pakistan where she belonged. That was the story. This year, it's given to this novel. Do remember the name called The Prophet Song. This International Booker Prize, as I said, it has been going on since 1969. Now, this International Booker Prize, basically earlier it was called, it started in 1969, but it was renamed in 2005 as a Man Booker International Prize. This is given to the work of fiction only. The novel has to be published in UK and Ireland. Anyone who is nominated and shortlisted for the final, so final six or seven authors are shortlisted, then the jury decides whoever is shortlisted will also get a prize of about £2,500. And the translator of the story, if the story was not written in English, anyone who has translated will also get £2,500 with this award. This brings us to the end of today's session. Here are a couple of practice questions. Please try and write the answers to those again. Look at the description of this video. In the description, you can see the link to a student translating portal. I have seen a lot of you in the comment section asking us about the link to the student translating portal. Please click on the description of the video where you will see a link of the student translating portal. You can use that. Give your answers there. You can see each other's answers. Give feedback to each other. Learn from each other's mistakes. That is the best way to go forward and learn. Thank you so much for joining in. Do join us tomorrow as well. For the next session on the Hindu News Super Analysis, have a good day ahead. Bye-bye. Jai Hind.